just as we go to the word today, um, as I was, I, I heard this message uh, a few days, uh, actually a little while back. And I believe I got some clarity about it a few days ago. I'm titling it, It's Harvest Time, which is an entire theme for the whole year. But the message is about that. It's harvest time for you, for us. But as I was going to put it together yesterday, I um, did this. It's like there wasn't a flow. I knew what it was, but the flow wasn't there. So I thought, you know what? I decided I'm just going to leave it alone, go to sleep, wake up, <laughs> and expect. The Bible says morning by morning, he wakened our ears to hear as to learn. And he speaks to us during the night while we sleep. There's a lot of scriptures to that extent. So I, so I did. And I woke up this morning. And, 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 as I, and as I woke up, I woke up and I realized I was hearing for a period of time during the night as I was sleeping. And I woke up with it. Which is for the glory of God. And I kind of wonder, well, what does that mean? You know, and so your brain begins to pull scriptures that you know that has to do with that. Whatever you do, do everything to the glory of God and so on. And, and you check with your spirit for the witness. And so I, I, I realized that there was, a, there was a theme within this message that the Lord wants you to receive, which is whatever you do all the year long, all the day long, it's for the glory of God. It must be for the glory of God. And that needs to be your commitment. That needs to be your dedication. Amen? Um, so let's pray over the word and, and then let's go. Let's go from there. Let's stand. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Now don't let anything hinder you from receiving the word today. But just declare in the name of Jesus. Say that with me. In the name of Jesus. I have ears to hear as a disciple, as the learned. And I take heed how I hear in Jesus' name. I receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to bring my soul into alignment with my spirit that dwells in Christ, that dwells in truth, that delights in the word. In Jesus' name, I believe for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to bring forth divine utterance and all that is needful, that it be on earth in my life in 2016 as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Let's have a seat. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. For the Lord is and how long? Amen. Does that include 2016? Amen. Luke chapter 10 verse 1 and 2 says, And after these things the Lord appointed other 70 also, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Now that verse is very pregnant with purpose for the believer. In that wherever we go, whatever we do, no matter where we go, we are going before his praise, before his face. We are going and we ought to be and have a conscious awareness of his presence. And we are going into every place like as John the Baptist Preparing the way of the Lord. In other words, wherever you go, you are affecting the atmosphere and everything in such a way that he can, make, he, he can be made manifest. And wherever you go, he goes. Amen? You can't go anywhere without him. Remember, you tie-dye together with him? <laughs> Amen? So you cannot show up without him showing up. But we need to have that conscious awareness so as to enable him and so that the Bible says the mystery of faith, the secret of faith lies in what? In a what? P 
pure conscience. So this conscious awareness is very important. It is a trigger for your faith. So anyway, these things the Lord appointed, after these things the Lord appointed 70 also, and he sent them two and two before his face and into every city and place whither he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great. It is great, it is abundant. But the laborers are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. That more laborers will go out so that we will be able to reap and harvest this abundance that is there. But also too, I believe that not only must we pray for more laborers or more harvesters, but I believe that we are to believe, teach, minister the word in such a manner as to edify and build up the laborers that are available that they could be more effective. Amen? In other words, you who are already out there, you who are already laborers, are to become more effective. Not only are you to have the manifestation that comes with the application of truth, because the Bible says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall what? Make you. It will make you free. It will cause a manifestation of liberty and freedom. So that not only do you have manifestation, but then you become the manifestation of the truth going somewhere to be multiplied. So that you become, so that not only do you have manifestation and fulfillment of the truth, but you literally duplicate yourself. You literally cause a multiplication to take place. Are you with me? Because God is after, uh, is after multiplication. That the whole earth might be filled with what? The glory of the Lord as water covered the sea. So we are talking about the fact that, you know, the Bible says God has appointed the weeks of harvest. I believe we have now come to a place we're harvest. We are to expect harvest. We are to be looking for the harvest. Jesus says, don't the figure that it's going to be two, three, four months, and then there's going to be harvest. He says the harvest is ripe. And in Mark chapter 4, and I believe verse 29, it says, when the harvest is ripe, and you recognize the fruit is ripe, what should you do? Put in the sickle and reap. Say reap. Amen. You see, it's one thing to sow. And we need to have some understanding and wisdom and grace to be able to sow. But we also got to know how to reap. If we don't know how to reap, harvest that is rightfully yours just dries up in the field. Amen? Now the harvest might be that you need to reap might be in the area of healing. It might be in the area of some emotional area. It might be in the area of your family. It might be in the area of just a breakthrough that you have to have. It is time for breakthrough. It is time there are areas where you may have struggled in. Well, it is time for you to have the breakthrough. There have been issues in your life that might have a long continuance in a negative sense. Well, it's time for that to come to the end, to come to an end, and for you to have the manifestation of the goodness of God here in the land of the living in your life. So we are talking about harvest time. Say harvest time. And we are, when we talk about harvest time, we are talking about fulfillment. We are talking about the manifestation of your inheritance. It is about fulfillment. It is about your, your, your inheritance being made manifest. Now, let me, let, me, let, me, let me communicate something which I have in different ways before, but let me say it again. When we, we, when we begin to comprehend the word of God and, and the plan of God and, and so on, we see that, we see as it says, I believe in Revelation 13 verse 8, that Jesus was slain when? From the what? Foundation of the world. Before God ever said, let there be light, Jesus was slain. But we also know that before the foundation of the world, you were chosen in him. Ephesians 1 verse 4. Before there was ever an Adam and an Eve and a garden of an Eden and night and day and light and darkness, you were chosen in him. But Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world, but 2,000 years ago, what happened? He went to the cross, died, and was raised up from the dead, and he, and he brought fulfillment to what was done from the foundation of the world. Isn't that right? 
But what also happened 2,000 years ago is that, when, is that you who were chosen in him from the foundation of the world, when Jesus died and was raised up, you are, were also in him, and you died, and you were also raised up together with him, and you were made to sit together with him in heavenly places at the Father's right hand. Amen? This is not something you've got to believe for. This is not something that you've got to use your faith for. This is something you simply need to have the revelation of and know that it is so. Are you with me? So 2,000 years ago, you were raised up together with him. And when you got born again and he said, Jesus, I receive you as the Lord of my life. I believe you were raised up from the dead. The moment you did that, you received fulfillment of what was accomplished 2,000 years ago. And bam, you got born again. The love of God was shed abroad in your heart. And everything began to look kind of, hey, all of a sudden people you hated, you, you, all of a sudden you begin to love them. Isn't that right? But now, here you are in 2016, and uh, oh, let me back up. In, so when you got born again, all that the inheritance that was yours, which is when Jesus was raised up from the dead 2,000 years ago, the Father made him heir of all things. And the Father gave him a most excellent name. Amen? And everything became his. God, the Father, looked at Jesus and called him God. I'm telling you, if God called you God, you God. Amen? Now, God ain't calling you or me God, but he called Jesus God. And he said, let all the angels of God, what? Worship him. Amen? Hallelujah. There is a man, Christ Jesus, a man, just as so we are men, right? There is a man that is in the Godhead. There is a man that is God today at the Father's right hand. He's our Lord. He's our Master. He is the head of the church. Can you imagine that? And through him, you have representation in the Godhead. That is so awesome. Anyway, let's, let's, let's come, not come back to earth. <laughs> but, <laughs> so, so here it is. So even as, 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 so when Jesus was raised up 2,000 years ago, he received all of the inheritance. Amen? You were raised up with him, all of it was yours, and you, because you were joined here with him. But when you got born again, 2000, when you got born again, whatever it was, 15, 20, 30 years ago, last week, whatever the case is, when you got born again, all of that inheritance, bam, became yours. You got born again. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, that you were born again unto an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, that faded not away, which means you have got an inheritance that belongs to you, that cannot be diminished. Cannot be diminished. No one can steal it. You can't lose it. You know, imagine, imagine you have a business. You've got a staff of about of 12. And one of your, and I mean, you know, people are giving into the ministry, you know, the widows, people from Herod's household, and so on. And you, one of your 12 staff members, you appoint him to be the treasurer, to watch over the finances. But he's a thief. And he steals. His name is Judas. And you are the boss. You're Jesus. And you know that the very one that you've appointed over the treasury as the accountant, as, uh, as the one that is to, 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 to be responsible over this money, you know he's a thief. And you appoint him knowing that, and he is stealing, and you know about it. But it don't bother you. Right? It doesn't affect you. Why? Because you've got an inheritance that cannot be diminished. Ha, ha, ha. Hey, that's awesome. You've got an inheritance. We're in inflation, deflation, or any other kind of Asian can do anything, can, can cause you to be diminished. Your needs are met according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. 
So this inheritance is yours. You were joint heir with Christ. You were heir of God. The Bible says you have obtained an inheritance. The Bible says the blood of Christ has qualified you for this inheritance. The Bible says you are blessed with every spiritual blessing. The Bible says, Paul said that one of the reasons God delivered me from the Gentiles and then sent me to them was to bring them to the knowledge of the fact of what their inheritance is and what belonged to them and for them to receive the forgiveness of sins. Say, I've got an inheritance. All right. In fact, my part, part of, part of my responsibility as a minister of the gospel is to communicate and to minister the word to you in such a manner, according to Colossians 1.25, that you might have the word fulfilled in you, which means what? To minister the word in such a way that you can have the fulfillment of the word of God, so that you can have the realization and the experience and the fulfillment of Christ, the very nature of God that is in you, being made real. Part of my responsibility, according to Joshua chapter 1 and verse 6, is to take you across the Jordan, take you into the promised land by the power of the Holy Ghost, and to help divide unto you the inheritance, help you to get what's legally yours, whether it be your healing, whether it be your breakthrough, whether it be your finances, whether it be your family, whether it be freedom from all the bondages and captivity that can come to you in this world. That is why even as we go forward into this year, in the early part of the year, two of the things that I do need to do is, number one, so that you can have your liberty, is to be able to minister to the Word so that individually you can be absolutely, totally free from every, every element of fear and be free from fear and have fear bow to you, bow its knee in your life. Which would also mean you'll have to have a knowledge of the love of God for you. Another thing, important thing that is necessary early in this year, because don't forget, the harvesters got to be equipped. Amen? The harvesters can't be out there in the field and be fainting. The Bible says you can't reap if you faint. Can you imagine here you are in the harvest field, and I mean there's corn, and there is healing, and there is, oh man, okahashataba. I mean there's all kinds of good stuff. I mean, I mean there's souls, there's, but you, the harvest, and it's ripe. But here you are, bam, you pass out. <laughs> the Bible says if you faint, you can't reap. Amen, is that right? You reap if you what? Faint not. So I got to make sure you're not faint, you don't faint. I got to make sure that you're equipped. I got to make sure that you're operating in liberty, that you're free from fear, and also that there are areas where the curse can get into our lives. That's just how it is. Amen? The Bible says the curse, causeless cannot come, but it also means if the curse has an opening, it can come in various ways. We're not teaching about that right now, but we got to be able to identify those things and kick them out, drive them out, so that the blessing of the Lord that is legally yours can function. Just because you were born again and all of this inheritance is yours and the blessing is yours and healing is yours, does not mean that you're going to walk in divine health, that you will walk in the blessing, that you will possess the inheritance. It this is not automatic. Amen? It is not automatic just because Jesus has paid the price and forgiveness of sins is available that you are going to live in a place where I know I'm forgiven. I'm free from condemnation. No, you got to know how to receive and walk in that. You got to know how to walk in your divine hell. You got to know how to possess your inheritance. You got to know how to shut the curse down, shut fear down, and to live and function in him where you belong. Hallelujah. So there is that responsibility for you to take a hold of this inheritance, for have it fulfilled in you. Amen? Now, we're talking about fulfillment. We're talking about possessing and obtaining your inheritance. So let me just share a couple of things that are necessary. Very simple, very practical. And I'm talking about the, uh, about the manifestation of your inheritance and the fulfillment of the word and the promises of God on various levels. Individually, collectively, the body of Christ, in, many of those area, uh, in all those areas. So turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. Let me just share you about four, four or five things that are necessary 
for you to obtain your inheritance. Amen? Hallelujah. Say, I want what's mine. Because it's mine. <laughs> Amen? And God is glorified when, you're, when you have your inheritance and you're manifesting it. God wants people to become so jealous of you that they want to know where is this, what, what's happening? Where is this coming from? And then you can point to him. Amen? Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. So let's look at a couple of things. Colossians chapter 3. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Let me, let, me, can I, let me back up a little bit. As we were saying, so here you are, chosen from the foundation of the world. 2,000 years ago when Jesus died, you died with him. You were raised up together with him. And all of this stuff became yours. Right? Everything that came as a result of the finished work of Christ, that became yours. When you got born again, whenever you got born again, bam, it came into your life, you got born again, and now it's really yours. But now here you are, you want the fulfillment and the manifestation of what is yours. Are you with me? Now, one of the reasons why, now listen to this statement very carefully. We talked some time ago about divine utterance. Is that right? Remember that? There is a purpose for divine utterance. You see this here? Is what God has already spoken. Now, by the way, what God has spoken, everything in here in this Bible is inspired by God. All scripture is given by what? The inspiration of God, and it is profitable. But all scripture is not, thus say the Lord. All scripture in the Bible is not the word of God. Now, let me say that carefully. And what I mean by that is, if you find Job saying something, and this is Job's opinion, and Job happened to think that the Lord give it and the Lord take it away, that's not God. God didn't say that. Job said that. Are you with me? Amen? If we find in here the devil saying, I'm going to exalt myself and I'm going to be like the most high God. I'm going to make my... That's not God. That's the devil, Lucifer speaking. When Peter says, some, says and does some things that are not in line, like Jesus, you're not going to go to the cross. That's not God. That's Peter speaking. Amen? Are you with me? So understand that. All right. So God has spoken. By his stripes you are healed. God spoke that. You be, he became poor that you might be made rich. God spoke that. The blessing of the Lord make it rich. God spoke that. All the many, many promises. God spoke them. I will be with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. God spoke that. When the enemy comes in one way, there are three, seven ways. God spoke that. Hallelujah. And there is a lot that he has said. But that which he has spoken, even now, he will give divine utterance. He will give divine utterance so that you can have fulfillment of what is spoken. Amen? That's why you need to hear from God. Amen? I could stand here today and I could declare certain things I could, for instance, even saying, even to say it to you, a simple thing like, you are to live 2016 for the glory of God. I can say that and it not be my own wonderful idea because I heard that from him. Jesus says, I only speak what I hear the Father say. And I only do what I see. What we hear from him and we have to speak what we hear. Amen. The Holy Spirit even shows us things to come. And that is why sometimes, especially when you're a pastor, you can know people are in certain situations even though you haven't heard a word from them because you know, God, need, you need to know because as a pastor, you have a responsibility over the flock. And as a pastor and as a shepherd under the chief shepherd, there's a responsibility to protect the sheep and fight off the lions. Not in my own strength, of course. Amen? Amen? Can you imagine what would happen? Remember how David, David fought off the lion and fought off the bear? Remember that? I mean, I mean, David took a stone and took out Goliath. What if it was Samson in the lion's den? What do you think would have happened? Man, you'd have teeth and hair everywhere. <laughs> Amen? I mean, David probably just choked the lion. Samson would do a lot more than that. I mean, the, I mean teeth would be flying everywhere, the lion's teeth. Anyway, what's my point? What is my point? My point is, as a shepherd, there is a responsibility 
to deal with the lion, to deal with the bear, to deal, to, to help by the Spirit of God lead the sheep into green pastures. For them to have fulfillment of the Word of God. Amen? And in order to do that, it's necessary to get divine utterance. But for you, it is also necessary when you have situations to hear from the Lord. That is why the Bible says, as I'm about to, to, to read right now in Colossians chapter 3, it says in verse 16, Let the Word of God dwell in you richly. And when it says, let the word of God dwell in you richly, we got to remember, the folks that Paul is speaking to, they didn't have Philippians. They didn't have Romans. They didn't have Galatians. They didn't have this Bible as you and I have. But the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, God in times past spoke by the prophets, but in these last days, he speaks unto us, how? By his son. So they were depending on the spirit of God and Christ within them to speak. And God says, what you hear from him, let it dwell within you richly. Learn to hear as the learned and recognize what he's saying as you have heard from him. Ephesians 4 verse 20. As you hear and as you see, do. Speak. You follow me? Because when you can speak, I mean, whatever the situation is, when you can hear from him and, do ex and speak what he gives you and do what he, what he shows you, fulfillment comes quickly. Now, it doesn't mean that if you haven't heard anything, you do nothing. Amen? If you haven't heard anything, do the Word of God. Do the best you can according to the Word of God by the Spirit of God. The Holy Ghost is here to lead you and guide you into all truth. But it's a lot easier to steer a moving vehicle than one that is stagnant. When you're standing up and you're doing nothing, it's hard. You ever try to push a vehicle when it's just, like, when it's just stagnant and steer it? No. But once it's moving, man, you could steer that thing a lot easier. So it doesn't mean that you do nothing if you haven't heard from God. You still have this written word to act on. You still have what he has spoken, what, he, what, what is written here. You follow me? But God will also give divine utterance so that for the very purpose of bringing fulfillment to what he's already spoken. So that you can have in 2016 what, you had, what, what, you, what, what became yours when you got born again. That you can have the fulfillment of it. We talked about fulfillment. Are you with me? Okay, so what are a couple of principles? Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, so whatever. Whatever you do is everything you do. Isn't that right? How should you do everything you do? Whether it be word or deed. Do all in what? In the name of Jesus. Who shall call about? Oh, man, there's a message right there. Do everything in the name of Jesus, which means what? Do everything. Jesus lives in his name. Do everything in the very person of Christ. Giving thanks. Do everything in the name of Jesus, remembering that that name is not only authority, which it is, against the works of the devil, to silence him, his accusations and everything else, his torment. Not only is it, is it authority, but the name of Jesus also indicates possession, inheritance. Because he was given a more excellent name, if he, I mean, Hebrews chapter 1, and I believe verse 4 or somewhere there. But if you back up in verse 2, you'll find that God made him heir of all things and said, here is this most excellent name. So that name includes the possession of heaven and earth. So whatever you do, good, bad, indifferent, whatever it might be, whatever you do, do it in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, recognizing that name belongs to you, and you have got rights, you have got authority, and do it with thanksgiving. That's one principle. Verse 23, and whatever you do, do it heartily, as unto the boss. Which boss? Jesus. Not, the, not your boss, I mean the, the, the boss you have in the natural realm that might be unfair, that might be greedy, that might be trying to give you all the, the, the jobs that nobody else wants to do and giving the good jobs to his friends and the bad assignments to you. Don't, don't, don't be affected by that. Whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. And the Bible says when you do that, what happens? Verse 24. You do that knowing. Say knowing. Say it again. One more time. Knowing. I'm going to come back to that. But that issue of knowing is a very important one. Actually, we've already mentioned that in some regards in this service. But our word knowing is connected up to confidence. When you can really know, you can have confidence. But we'll come back to that. So do it as unto the Lord. Knowing. Knowing what? That 
from the Lord that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance because you serve the Lord. So you might be in some kind of job that you might not particularly like. You might not be enjoying it. But while you are there, do it as a service to God, as unto the Lord. And the Bible says, when you do that, you're not just going to get your paycheck, but you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. Remember, you have this infinite inheritance that cannot fade away. In other words, it's like you, in other words, there are withdrawals that God will cause to come into your life. Amen? All right. Do all. That's talking about doing all to the glory of God. Doing everything to the praise of his glory. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, this has to do with your personal harvest, the, the fulfillment of the word of God in your life. But here's a third point that is important to the manifestation, the fulfillment of, of, of your inheritance and of the promises. Turn with me to Acts chapter 20. Glory to God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hmm. Okay. Anyway, Acts chapter 20, verse 32. Now, and by the way, Acts chapter 20, verse 32, while you're reading that, just, just hear this. While you're turning to that, rather, <laughs> hear this. In Acts 26, verse 18, Paul says that God called him and sent him to the believers to, turn it, to deliver them from the power of darkness to the power of God, from light to from darkness to light, and, and, and for them to receive forgiveness of sins, and they receive their inheritance. So about that inheritance, Paul says in Acts chapter 20, and I, like, I love this verse, he said, and this was some believers, he was, gonna, he was with them for a while, but now he was going to leave, and he was going to leave and go somewhere else. And he said to them, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able, which is able, to build you up and give you an inheritance among them which are sanctified. In other words, it's like if, can you imagine you going away and you're leaving your children, you love your children, you want to make sure that while you are gone, your children, your kids are going to be fine. So what do you do? You commit them, you commend them to a qualified babysitter that you have confidence in. For, them to, for that babysitter to take care of them while you're gone. But here is the babysitter that he commend you to. The word of God. The word of his grace. See, he says, I commit you to the word of God. And he says, this word of God will cause such grace in your life, such sufficiency, such empowerment. It will build you up, but it will also give you your inheritance. It will also cause that inheritance that is yours to be made manifest in your life. For you to obtain it. For you to possess it. For you to manifest it. Amen? So what am I saying? Number three, as to the fulfillment of your inheritance and the fulfillment of the promise of God is the word of God and your relationship with the word of God in your life. The Bible says, mm, in Deuteronomy, let me, let me flip over there. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you a little story about this verse that came up recently. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Glory to God. Deuteronomy 32. Say the word of God. So Paul says, I commend you to the word of God. If believers could only grasp the power and the authority of the word of God, that the word of God is your vehicle for success and for, and for, and for the fulfillment of what God has already spoken. He says, my word will not return void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. Deuteronomy 32 verse 47 says, for it is not a vain thing. For you. Because it is your life. And through this thing. You shall prolong your days. In the land. Whither you go over Jordan to possess it. And he was talking about the words of the law. The word of God. He said the word of God is your life. It is your very life. And it will prolong your days. And I believe prolong your days mean two things. It means you can get a lot more out of your day. It will lengthen your days in that sense. But it also means you're going to live long in the earth. Now the Lord, for me, the Lord uses numbers to, 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 to bring things to my thinking quite often. A few weeks ago, was it, how long was it? A few weeks ago, it was last week, I think. Anyway, it was, yeah, it was Christmas Day, actually. 
We were on the way to New York, New York, my wife and I, to see her mother, who was in the hospital. Some things had happened. She was, she had, was admitted to the hospital, what, the day before, whatever, something like that. I, I may have got the days mixed up. But either way, and as we were going, um, we found out that the room number she was in was room 3247. So as soon as I heard 3247, I said to my wife, 3247, Deuteronomy 3247. She said, what should I tell her? Tell her this. And tell her about that number in the room, 3247, and read the scripture to her, that the word is your life. And if you will get a hold of the word, it will prolong your days, and it will prolong your life. Amen? Hallelujah. Talk about the word. You know, I remember very, sometime last year, I would pop up, I have my clock over to the right-hand side. All right? And not those things that you use on the phone to wake you up. I still have one of those old-time stuff that alarms, and you got to reach across and press it and push it. <laughs> Amen. And I would wake up a couple of times, uh, several nights in a row, and I, would, and I would look across at the clock, and I see 333. Now, I'm not telling you to get spooky where numbers are concerned, okay? <laughs> right? Don't let your faith be in the wisdom of men. Let it be in the power of God. So don't, don't go getting, getting goofy. <laughs> over this. But anyway, I saw tree, tree, tree. And it happened a couple nights. And then I, I kind of, hmm, what is this saying? And of course, it came to me. Jeremiah 33, verse 3. Which is, call on to me and I will answer you. And I will show you great and mighty things that you knew not of. So I thought, when I, and I began to meditate and analyze, wait a minute. God, I mean, can you imagine if you know that tomorrow morning you can wake up and you can have I don't know, it's one of the great men of God that you respect, Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland. I don't know. What's the name? Is no longer here, but well, what was the lady, the miracle lady? Come on, who's the miracle lady? Catherine Kuhlman, or some one of those mighty people of God. I'm Smith Wigglesworth. Tell you, hey, tomorrow morning at so and so time, come, we're going to pray together. We'll spend time together and seek the Lord, and we're going to pray together. Would you be there for that appointment? You think you'll have any problem waking up? No. But here, God, the Holy Ghost, is saying to you, come, come call upon me. Come, let us reason together. Come, seek my face. Come, let's have a prayer meeting. And you got a chance to meet with him. I'm telling you, you begin to, man, I'm telling you, it, it, will, it will solve some issues, wouldn't it? Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I don't know why I told you all of that. But either way, <laughs> it was good anyhow. Right? I commend you to the word of his grace. The word of God will give you your inheritance. The word of God, the Bible says, it's alive. It is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. You need to think the word. Talk the word. Be let your motivation come from the word. Let act the word. Walk in love. When the word of God become so engrafted in you, the Bible says it will save your soul, which means what? It will bring your soul into alignment with your spirit. You cannot exaggerate, I can't exaggerate the importance of the word of God. And you do it continually, but I want to show you something. Turn with me to First Thessalonians chapter 2. I know the Bible speaks about in a parable of the sower. It says how that the word in some cases, it produced tenfold, a hundredfold, thirtyfold, and so on. But when you study the parable of the soul, which is in recorded in Mark chapter 4, Matthew chapter 13, Luke chapter 8, when you study the parable of the soul, you will find that a harvest, and we're talking harvest, we're talking fulfillment, we're talking manifestation, you will find that a harvest that comes up, you'll find that there is nothing wrong with the seed. The seed doesn't determine whether you're going to have a harvest or not. The seed is fine. The seed is the word of God. It is incorruptible, undefiled. Faith is not a way. The word of God is incorruptible. But what happens is that the soil that that seed is planted in can affect the harvest you get. If the soil, if the ground is hard like concrete, it don't take root. If the soil has a whole bunch of rocks and, and stuff and, uh, uh, that, that, that crowds it and chokes it, it doesn't produce. If the soil has all these thorns and, and bushes and 
stuff that comes up and strangles it, it doesn't produce. Nothing wrong with the seed, but the problem is the soil. So Jesus, in explaining the parable, he, he mentioned a couple of things. He mentioned some of those things that can choke the word. He mentioned tribulation and test and persecution. He mentioned the fact that when we don't have understanding, before we even leave church, the devil will steal the word immediately. And he mentioned many of those things. But he also, at the very beginning of the parable, he said something that I think is very, very, very significant. He said, take heed. In one parable, he said, take heed what you hear, what it is you're listening to. Are you being filled up with, with what, you, what you Google? Are you being filled up with a doctor's report? Are you being filled up with, 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 with what happened to sister so-and-so? Are you being dominated by the experiences of the past or what? What are you hearing? But not only did he say take heed what you hear, he also said take heed how you hear. And that is so important. But we tend to ignore that part, how you hear. How do you hear? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Say, I want the word to produce. Amen? Now don't forget the word is capable. The word was capable of what? Bringing fulfillment to itself. The word, the seed is in the word. The fruit is in the very seed. The future is right here in the seed. All the corn, all the apples that will ever come out of that tree is right in that seed. All the healing that you ever need is in by his stripes you heal. All you need is to get it manifested. Are you with me? That is why the promises of God are so critical. Because it will cause the very nature of God to show up. Amen? So, how you hear. First Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm just isolating that point. Verse 13. Paul says, for this cause also, thank we God without ceasing. Because when you receive the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectively, effectually works also in you that believe. The word works effectively in you that believe, and the reason why it does is because of how you received it. Did you receive it as a word of man? Did you receive it as just a nice idea? Did you receive it as, oh, this is a wonderful new concept? Or did you receive this as the literal word of the Lord God Almighty? The Bible says in, in Romans chapter 3 and verse 4, Let God be true and every man a liar. In other words, let God be true. If God said it, that's the truth. My opinion or the opinion of any other human being doesn't matter. Let God be true and every man a liar. When you have that perspective, and then, you, and then when you see something in the Word, man, it becomes a discovery. Wow, look what he said. Look what is the case. Amen? Without that perspective, you're not going to get revelation. And without revelation, you're not going to know. And when you don't know, you're not going to have the level of confidence to fight off the unbelief. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2, that the word preached didn't prove for them. Why? It wasn't mixed with faith. It wasn't mixed with a confidence in the word. It wasn't mixed with, 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 with seeing it that way, talking about it that way, thinking accordingly. And because it, it, it wasn't, even though the word and the gospel and the truth was valid, it wasn't mixed with faith. Bam, it didn't happen. You say, well, I, 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 for me, it's very frightening when I recognize that Jesus described four soils and three of those soils were unproductive and only one soil was good. If I took that on the surface, it would mean 75% of those that hear the word of God, the word would not produce in their life. That's if I took it literally. That might not be the case. Are you with me? It means then, for you, there's a 75% the word might not produce in you. So you've got to take heed to make sure that you're in the 25%. You've got to make sure that you take heed how you hear, what you hear. Make sure that you get rid of those stones, those thorns, and those things that will choke the word and give the word the opportunity, the word that is your life, that is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword to bring forth its harvest that it was designed to. Are you with me? So... 
Hosea chapter 10, verse 12, I don't, need, we don't want to turn to it right now. It says, you therefore need to sow to yourself in righteousness, reap in mercy. And then he uses this phrase, break up the fallow ground of your heart. Amen? Break up the fallow ground of your heart. In order before you stick that seed in the ground, man, get a pickaxe. Get some kind of fork. And you begin to turn that soil upside down. You begin to break it up. Prepare the soil for the seed of the word. Are you with me? So that it will produce. And you can have a good harvest. In other words, whether we like it or not, in some areas of our life, our heart is hardened. Our ground is fallow. There are some areas where, man, we get quick results. Nothing here that shall not be revealed. Damn, finding it is not a problem. My heart is so tender in that area. But in some other areas, maybe in the financial arena, I might not get as quick results. Maybe in the area of emotions, I might not get quick results. Because there are things that have happened that have created thorns and messed me up in that area. So I need to break up the fire going in my heart in every area. How do I do that? Thank God, the same word will do it. That is why the Bible speaks about meditating in the word. When you meditate in the word and you go to bed with that verse of scripture, I am the heel of the Lord. I will not fear. The Lord is the strength of my life. I will not be afraid. The Lord will help me. The Lord will uphold me. He will uphold me with the right hand of his righteousness. Greater is when you go to bed saying that and you wake up muttering that, at the beginning that might not produce. Because at the beginning, all you're doing is breaking up the fallow ground of your heart. But if you keep on doing it, the Bible says, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth. You'll become intimate with the truth, and the truth will produce a baby. Are you with me? The truth will produce its harvest, but it takes a continuing. So, you, so meditating will break up the fallow ground of your heart and bring your heart to the place where it is good soil for that seed to produce. That is why the Bible can put such a guarantee on meditating in the Psalms chapter 1. You become like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth fruit in its season and your leaves will not wither. And whatever you do will prosper. It doesn't matter what the environment is. Amen? It doesn't matter what's happening with other people. A thousand could be falling at your left and ten thousand at your right hand, but it doesn't have to touch you. The economy could be bad. makes no difference because you've got the word of God producing. What am I saying? You could be totally, completely good soil. Hallelujah. So number four, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12. And let me speed up, double up here now. All right? Are we all here? These things will cause you to have the fulfillment of the word of God in your life in 2016. I'm saying that to you emphatically. I'm saying that to you upon the authority of the truth of the word of God and upon the authority of the power of the sacrifice and the Holy Ghost. And if you mix it with faith, you will have the harvest. You, it's guaranteed. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 12 says, And that you be not slothful. You know, what's another word for slothful? I didn't say that. I heard you said it. <laughs> you said it, okay? So don't be slothful, but be followers or imitators of them who through faith and patience inherit the promise. The Bible says that when you are slothful, he that sleepeth, Proverbs 10 verse 5, he that sleepeth in harvest will bring shame. He will be a disgrace. He will be separated from the grace. Amen? Grace is available. You don't want to be separated from that empowerment and that enablement. So laziness is not good. So be diligent where the word is concerned. And then it says, and be imitators of those who through faith, say faith, and patience will inherit the promises, which means what? They're going to have that promise and the, the, the inheritance manifested. So let's talk a tiny little bit about faith. Just a tiny little bit. Not much. Hebrews chapter 10. All right, stay close because we're going to go faster. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 35 says, Cast not away therefore. Mm -hmm. We've got to go to verse 34. That therefore, whenever you see a therefore, what should you ask yourself? What is the therefore? And quite often the therefore is there. Because of what came before. So let's go back to 
before. Does that make sense? Hallelujah. You just learned something, didn't you? <laughs> Hallelujah. It's called rightly dividing the word. Hallelujah. All right. So Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34. For you had compassion of me and my bonds, and you took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. Knowing, say knowing. Ha, ha, ha. Say knowing. Say it again. Knowing. And, and just for right now, let me just put it out there. Knowing is connected up to confidence. All right? Knowing in yourself that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance exists in that realm in heaven. Knowing that, don't cast away your confidence. Knowing that there is a material, a spiritual material for whatever it is you're believing to be made manifest, it's already there, it's already done. The sacrifice of Christ has already accomplished it. Knowing that, do not cast away your confidence. Just because it looked like it's not working out. Just because there's all of this discouragement and discouragement and, and disappointment trying to shout at you and, and confuse you and bombard you and, and, and intimidate you and to try to cause you to give up and quit. Just because you're not seeing it, don't quit. Don't give up. You've got a substance. You've got proof. You know something. Say, I know something. Cast not away there for your confidence because there's a payback. There's a great recompense of reward. You have need of patience so that after you've done the will of God, after you've applied the sacrifice of Christ, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that cometh will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by that confident trust in that which he doesn't see, but based on what he believes, knowing what is finished. But if any man draw back, my souls will have no pleasure in him. But we are not. You are not of those that draw back onto perdition. But you are those that believe to the end point of the saving of your soul. You are those that believe to the point where your soul will come in line with the truth that, that dwells in your spirit. Now, faith is what? Faith is that substance. Faith is that substance of the things hoped for and the evidence you have for the things that are not seen. Faith is the confidence. Faith is connected to confidence. Here again, let me show you something. As I said, this is how God deals with me. Right? This is how it is. But uh, I, I, for a period of time, I would see, even last night I saw it. Flipped over, my clock is on the right-hand side. <laughs> right? And I see 11-11. And I see it more than once. This night, that night. Now, uh, uh, so I, what, 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 what my brain says? My brain says 11-11, Hebrews 11-11, the faith chapter, says that true faith, Sarah, herself, not somebody for her, not Abraham for her. Did you hear that? Sarah herself. Sometimes you believe that somebody else's faith will work for you. Hey, that's good too, but that's not what happened here. This is not what it's talking about. Fear Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed. And she was delivered of a child when she was past the age of childbearing. You're not supposed to get babies at 90 years old. And why? Why did this happen? Because she judged him faithful who had promised. In other words, even though, oh, I'm 90 years old. According to science, this can't work. According to my doctor, this has never happened before. I've Googled everything I could Google. Nothing supports it. And there's not one thread of evidence anywhere that says I could conceive. But God has promised. And you know what? I'm going to stand as a judge over God. And I judge him to be faithful. Question, how do you judge God when all the circumstances don't seem to be working out? How do you judge him? Do you judge him to be faithful? But she judged him to be faithful, and because of that, after she judged him to be faithful, bam, here came the strength for her to conceive. And of course, we got Isaac. Faith, confidence, confidence that comes from knowing. Knowing what? Knowing who he is. Knowing who you are. Knowing what he has done, what he has finished in the sacrifice. It is a confidence that comes from the, from the identity of who you really are. Say knowing. Knowing is, is, you see, when you know, then believing 
becomes effortless. Do you have to believe you're seated in that chair right now? Come on, man. Work up your faith. Get your faith in line so you can believe you're seated in that chair. And that chair can take your weight. How much effort does it take for you to believe? None. Why? Because you know. All right? You know. So when you get into a place of knowing, it becomes easy. So there are certain things you need to know. Now, it doesn't come automatically just because you're born again. Knowing, the Bible says meditation brings what? Revelation, that's knowing. And then revelation produces the motivation. And then the motivation causes you to take action. And then the action produces fruit. You hear some things you need to know. I, don't, I know that I'm a new creation. I don't have to believe that. I don't have to think that. You don't have to read. You know you're a new creation, don't you? Does anybody have a doubt that when you're born again, you become a new creation? You know he was made to be sin that you were the righteousness of God. You know you were tied dyed and baptized into him. You know you were raised up together with him. You ought to know that you've been made to sit together with him in heavenly places. These are things we ought to know that we know. And when I know it's a different, I know he bore my sicknesses and carried my infirmities. I don't have to try to believe that. I know that. I believe by his stripes I'm healed. I know he did this. We got to know. And out of that knowing comes what? Confidence. You know, people that wonder, it, it might not be God's will to heal you. You know what's the problem? They don't know. If they don't have a, people say, oh, they have a faith problem. No, they have a knowing problem. They don't have the revelation of what he did, that he carried those infirmities in his own body. If they knew that, they would not be wondering if it could be God's will. God heals some people sometime, but not everybody, all the time. You never know where the Lord's going to be. That's, uh, that's nothing more than ignorance trying to find a place to land. You follow me? And um, this is not to knock somebody, but this is to point out that what they need is revelation. Not the determination, I'm going to believe. I'm going to believe for his healing. I'm going to believe for his healing power to show up. You can try that, but it's not going to work if you have not come to the place of knowing. Because it's, are you going to will yourself to believe? As soon as you quiet down, that unbelief is going to come sneaking on you. And then what? I thought God healed me. I guess he didn't. Are you following me? Revelation knowledge. The word of God. Meditating on the word. Produce revelation. Meditating on the word will break up the foul of of your heart. So that you can hear. You can take heed how you hear. And you can hear right. So that the word is not a suggestion. It's not another philosophy. Another principle. It's not another way of looking at it. The word is the fruit. Hallelujah. Okay, I got to stop this. I got I to gotta really... Okay, one more. Number five. Your relationship with the Holy Spirit is also important. Because the Bible says, when the Holy Spirit has come, He will lead you and to guide you into all truth. John 7, 16, 13. The essence of that is that the Holy Spirit will bring you into the place that God has prepared for you. He will bring you into your inheritance. He will cause it to be made manifest. So you have to develop that relationship with him. How do you do that? Praying in tongues is a wonderful way. Because the Bible says that when you be full of the Holy Ghost, be drunk with the Holy Ghost. Drunk people, man, they lose their own. They don't do. when, when you get drunk, I'm telling you, you just go along. <laughs> Right? You, you become, you, a drunk person becomes under the control of that which he drank. And you know why he's under the control of, of what he drank? Because he drank a lot. Well, drink a lot of the Holy Ghost and be under the control of the Holy Spirit. Amen? By prayer, by praying in tongues, by meditating, by fellowshipping with him. The Bible says, so you've got to develop that relationship. You got to develop walking with him. And you can't, the Bible says two people can't walk together if they be, be, be not agreed. He is the Holy Spirit. So holiness, which is a fruit, it doesn't happen overnight in a sense. Holiness is something you walk in. 
Holiness is something you, you, where, where, you, where you come into that place where I belong to him. I'm not my own. I am his. It is his life. It's all about pleasing him. And obedience. Obedience. I mean, you know, you know like the, the people that were there arguing with the Lord. No, you know, Lord, yeah, but I don't believe you this. Yes, Lord, but, but, but. Can you imagine you really fellowshipping and hanging out and having a cool time with somebody? Every time you say something, they have a butt. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't want to be unkind, but I, would, I might be tempted in the natural. I'm not the Holy Ghost. But in the natural, I might ask them to take their butts somewhere else. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Anyway, but, but the point is, when you walk in obedience, when you walk in a manner where you honor him, where you reverence him, where you fear him. And by fearing him, mean you're not wise in your own eyes, but you exalt his opinion, his position, his thoughts, and you obey. When you do that, man, that relationship grows, and he can lead you, he can guide you into all truth. Because when we're talking about fulfillment, we're talking about manifestation. Jesus says in John 14, 21, that if you love me, you're going to obey me, you're going to do my word, and me and my father will do what? manifest we show up we bring you evidence so that you know we're there hallelujah and it says uh, as we're going back it says through faith and patience patience is perseverance patience is that is, is, is uh, and perseverance is, is, is where i don't quit i don't give up and that uh, and james said in james 1 verse 2 that when you do that it is evidence of your love of God. To them that love me will I give. And, and let me, I'm not quoting that correctly. Let me give it to you correctly. James chapter 1 and verse 12 says this. It says, blessed is empowered to prosper. Is that person that endures temptation. Because when he is tried, he received the crown of life which the Lord had promised for them that love him. Instead of to them that endure temptation, no, to them that love him. In other words, when you refuse to submit to the unbelief, to the pressure of the test, and you say, no, no matter what it looks like, I believe God. God says, that's a, you are demonstrating your love and your commitment to me. And the Bible says when you do that, there is going to be an empowerment. Uh, uh, to be blessed is to be empowered to have success. It's not just faith, but it's through faith and patience that you obtain the, the promises. Which meanings what? It's not just faith, but it's faith and remaining in faith. Remaining in faith is patience. Amen? Faith is the dot. But when you connect a whole bunch of dots, you get a line. That line is patience. The dot is faith. Make sense? So patience is the long continuance of faith. Does that make sense? Glory to God. And talk right. The Bible says in Titus 1, verse 1 and 3, that when you talk right, what happens? God has ordained that his nature, that manifestation will come as you declare and acknowledge the truth. That's how it works. That's why we talk right. We don't talk right just because we sound good. We don't talk right to impress one another. We don't talk, yes, we do talk right to shut the devil up. But we talk right because it's right. We talk right because this is how the kingdom operates. We talk right because this is how faith is released. We talk right so as to declare our agreement with what Jesus has already done, with who we already are, and with who he is, and what it is that we know. Amen? And when you do that, faith, that is that substance, comes into manifestation and gives materiality to what it is you're hoping to be fulfilled and causes the fulfillment to take place. Through faith and patience, they obtain the promises. You mix the gospel, you mix the truth with faith, a prophet. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let me pray a verse of scripture over you as we close. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. No, chapter, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11. This is my prayer for you. Verse 11. That God would come to you worthy of his calling. Which means, it is not about your deserving, it doesn't mean that. But that God would see you positioned. You know, the Bible says, he that looketh look back is not fit for the kingdom. 
What does that mean? It means he's not rightly positioned. The Bible says, they that operate in certain ungodliness shall not inherit the kingdom of God. What does that mean? Does it mean they're not, not going to make it and they're not going to go to heaven? No, it doesn't mean that. I'm referring to Ephesians 5 verse 5. But what it is saying is that if they operate in certain ungodly behaviors, then what happened? They're not positioned rightly for the kingdom of God to function. For one thing, it will damage their conscience, and that is the key to their faith. Isn't that right? So he says, so, so I don't want you to get God would... Uh, this issue about God would count you worthy to mean to get an uninvestant condemnation thing. That's not what it's about. But anyway, 